Okay, greetings and welcome to a new sub-series of the Randall Carlson podcast. This is going to be Randall Reports, where we cover some new news and scientific papers and let Randall give some commentary and feedback and uh, uh, go through some of the details of the newsworthy information that's coming out related to the many topics that he covers and we're covering in the Cosmographia podcast. So the latest one is quite recent, the Torrid Complex Smoking Gun Detection of Cometary Activity. And uh, Randall's going to read some of the abstract and uh, there's lots of things that we could get into on this and uh, it directly relates to uh, the Taurus that just uh, passed through a week ago and uh, related to the last Halloween, Randall reveals that uh, we got put out. So Randall, do you want to dig into this one and welcome to episode one? Well, thank you, Brad. It's good to be here with you. And um, yeah, I'm kind of excited about this. This is going to give us an opportunity to make some relatively short, succinct discussions of things that are in the news. Uh, it might be very complimentary to our newsletter that comes out every month where I try to uh, present some of the um, uh, some of the new research that's coming out that are uh, of interest to uh, cosmographians. Uh, so, uh, with relative, uh, relative to the torrid, uh, meteor stream, uh, yes, you mentioned that the connection with Halloween, we're actually still in the outer fringes of the torrid stream. It's a very old meteor stream. And because it's old, it's diffuse because young meteor streams tend to be clumped and the longer they uh, exist and the more they're circulating around the solar system, the more spread out they get. So the more diffuse they get, the individual meteors spread apart and um, the torrid stream seems to be a very old stream. So uh, about four decades, I guess now, I've been following the work. Well, let's see, since early 80s when they came out with the Cosmic Serpent, um, Victor Klub and William Napier. That was a book that really uh, set me off onto a whole uh, trajectory of research about um, uh, the interrelationship between the Earth and the, and the cosmos. And uh, it's a very interesting book. Uh, I don't know if it's still in print. Uh, we should probably check that out. But anyways... Uh, and th those are the guys you referred regularly as the neo-catastrophists. Yes, the new catastrophism uh, is, you know, which encompasses asteroid impacts and mega floods and mass extinctions and so on. It's kind of the, the uh, like um, I've talked about in numerous places, uh, how at the founding of geology, in the days of early geology, most of the founding fathers of geology were catastrophists. And it was only later towards the end of the 19th century and early 20th century when Geology became a formalized academic tradition with uh, its own set of dogmas and so on that it became uh, very gradualistic, very uniformitarian. And we do see that there have been exceptions to that all along. Some of the things that we've talked about a lot have been mega floods. So one has to mention J. Harlan Bretz and his work um, in the 20s and 30s, which was stood out um, quite dramatically from the background of strict gradualism. But in the 1980s, we had the realization that Earth has been impacted more than previously thought by things from space. And what led into that insight, of course, I think most people who watch this podcast know that uh, in, the in 1980, there was published the paper by Walter Alvarez and his team that um, connected the iridium layer in Gubbio, Italy, with the extinction of the dinosaurs, which has subsequently been verified over and over again that the planet did get dusted uh, with a large amount of iridium uh, right at the horizon that saw the disappearance of the dinosaurs. And I kind of consider that a turning point when, um, you know, the, the kind of the window opened to a much more uh, accepted view of catastrophic events in Earth history. Um, so one of the things that, uh, though, that how, how the impact uh, scenarios have evolved is that initially it was seen as something that was of considerable interest from the long-term perspective, the geological 
uh, paleontological perspective, but not so much the archaeological perspective, not so much the, the human perspective. And this is where the uh, changes in catastrophism have evolved since uh, the 19, early 1980s, the recognition that just as uh, hypervelocity impacts played a, a very important role in the history of life on Earth and the geological uh, progression of the Earth, so impacts have likely played a very important role in human history, which has not up to this time been uh, recognized as such. But each year that goes by is uh, more evidence is accumulating that, yes, indeed, incursions of things from outer space encountering the Earth have actually played a very significant role in Earth history. And so this is what brings us back to the work of Victor Klub, uh, Bill Napier, David J. Asher, and Duncan Steele, who I think are kind of the, the, the primary exponents of this idea of coherent catastrophism. Um, and quoting from uh, a, a, an article that appeared in Vistas and Astronomy in 1994, Co coherent catastrophism is uh, theorizes that on time scales relevant to mankind, the prime collision hazard is posed by temporally correlated impacts rather than random ones. This is a very important idea. Right. And as I mentioned in the, the newsletter that has just gone out, if this scenario is true, it carries the most profound implications with respect to life and human civilization on Earth. Um, and then more specifically, the definition of coherent catastrophism goes on to say that, and I quote, the mechanism whereby coherent incursions into and through the terrestrial atmosphere occur is described as being the result of giant cometary bodies arriving in orbits with perihelia in the inner solar system Hierarchical fragmentation of such large bodies results in numerous kilometer-sized objects being left in short period orbits. Many more smaller objects in the 10 to 100 meter size range are only recently observed and are expected to be replenished in clusters in particular orbits as a result of continuing disintegrations of large differentiated cometary objects, end of quote. Let's just uh, take that apart a little bit. Um, the, rec the mechanism whereby coherent incursions, in other words, incursions, not just randomly, but as part of a, a periodical process uh, into and through the terrestrial atmosphere occur um, as a result of giant cometary bodies. And in this case, the idea is that the torrid meteor stream is a consequence of this coherent catastrophism process, that a giant comet came into the inner solar system sometime 20, at least 20,000 years ago, maybe 25, maybe even 30,000 years ago. It then began to undergo a hierarchical fragmentation process. And it says uh, in that quote that the giant cometary bodies arriving in orbits with perihelia in the inner solar system, perihelia is when it it's in its orbit, its closest passage to the sun. And so the inner solar system would be within the orbit of Mars, or even more importantly, within the orbit of the Earth. And then it goes on to say hierarchical fragmentations of such large, bo large bodies, and that is considered to be anything greater than about 100 kilometers or 60 miles in diameter, which could spawn many, many, many thousands of sub-kilometer objects. So the interesting thing about that is, is uh, you know, the Tunguska object of 1908 may very well have been a member of that uh, particular system, the Torrid, the Torrid system. There are two uh, crossings of the stream that the Earth uh, makes every year. Um, one peaks late October, early November, and the other is the um, late June, early July. And in our next episode, we could go into elaborate a little bit more on uh, some of the background of the Torrids so people can understand specifically some of the research that's led to this and um, some of the evidence that shows that there may have been numerous encounters between the Earth and members of, of the particular uh, 
torrid meteor stream and its sub families. And, and um, due to the trajectory of that, the, the summer torrids, uh, that would match with some of the, uh, eyewitness accounts that made, made it sound like it was coming directly from the sun. Yes, that's right. Because right. yes, the summertime torrids, um, have already made their perihelion passage. So they've come in from space out there near the orbit of Jupiter. They've circled around the sun and now they're coming out from behind the sun. And of course, when they're behind the sun, they're, they're going to be totally invisible and they have to get some distance away from the sun before they uh, emerge into visibility. But in this case, the Tunguska object was not seen. Um, it basically caught us by surprise. And the people who did see it um, emerging from the sky associated it very closely with the sun. It looked like uh, people, you know, dis described it as being disgorged from the sun or born out of the sun. And that would certainly fit. It would put the object in the region of the sky where it would need to be to be consistent with a torrid meteor. And then, of course, June 30th um, is right at the peak of the summertime torrid. So the timing of it and the, uh, the, um, the placement of it are both consistent with it being a member of the torrid stream. Um, and they do address that in this new paper. That yes, they do. That, that, this, that the Tunguska object was likely part of that torrid complex. They, they repeatedly refer, refer to it as the torrid complex. The torrid complex, right, because it consists of a whole uh, suite of various families. Um, because think about this. You've got the one object. It begins to fragment into multiple objects. But then those, fra those objects can further fragment. And there are many things, forces, internal and external, that can cause those fragments to be perturbed, which will put them on a slightly different trajectory. Then they will continue to undergo further fragmentations. And so you get these multiple interrelated streams. But in this case of this new paper, what they did was they essentially analyzed the motion of about 100 different, no, I think it was 140, 100, We'll, we'll look that up in just a second, um, meteors, and was able to um, trace them back to um, a single a single object. And, and that's part of how they're defining the, the length of time since the, the parent object uh, disintegrated. Right. If it, if it had been longer ago, then the stream would be much more dispersed uh, and much smaller objects. And if it was more recent, then there would still be larger objects and it wouldn't be <clears throat> as di as dispersed through the through the stream. So Correct. Um, they've been able to pin that down, say, in around 20,000, 25,000 years ago, this large, potentially 100 yes. kilometer wide object started started its procedure of, of breaking up and entering, uh, you know, the, the earth's atmosphere on a regular basis, even. Exactly. And, and you can picture that, um, as the stuff is breaking up, um, it's spawning meteors. And in fact, is even at the final, the end stage of this process is going to be cosmic dust. And it's very likely that torrid meteors have impacted Mars have probably impacted Jupiter have impacted the moon. In fact, there we have some evidence that there have torrid meteors have impacted the moon. Certainly, uh, impacted the Earth. Now, what's interesting is that that the the neo catastrophists um, have been theorizing for you know since literally since the eighties that that Earth has encountered the byproducts of this gigantic the disintegration of this gigantic progenitor comet that yielded the torrid meteor streams. Now, then in 2007, the paper came out by Richard Firestone, Alan West, James Kennett, and I think 23 others that was entitled Evidence for an Extraterrestrial Impact 12,900 Years Ago that Contributed to the Megafaunal Extinctions and the Younger Dryas Cooling. <clears throat> now, at that time, there was no real connection between the um, the torrid meteor stream and whatever um, hypothetical object, unknown object or objects had impacted the earth um, 12,900 years ago. But then uh, Victor Klub 
came out with the paper in March of 2010. It was published in the monthly notice of the Royal Astronomical Society. And in the abstract, this is what he says. Intersection with the debris of a large, that is 50 to 100 kilometer short period comet during the upper Paleolithic, which would put it right in that window of, you know, 12 to 13,000 years ago, provides a satisfactory explanation for the catastrophe of celestial origin, which has been postulated to have occurred around 12,900 years before present, and which presaged a return to Ice Age conditions of duration approximately 1,300 years. The Torrid complex appears to be the debris of this erstwhile comet. It includes at least 19 of the brightest near-Earth objects. Sub-kilometer bodies in meteor streams may be present. The greatest regional impact hazard on time scales of human concern. Um, and then he goes on in the introduction to say that the sudden onset of the Younger Dryas cooling 12,900 years ago was marked by intense wildfires over North America, major disruption of human culture, and the rapid extinction of 35 genera of North American mammals. A thin, carbon-rich black layer of this age has been identified at many sites across North America uh, and has been identified um, at, it coincide, sorry, it coincides in age with the Younger Dryas boundary. So um, that's when, with that paper, now we begin to see this convergence of these, of these two paradigms coming together and kind of reinforcing and complementing each other. Um, so then this new paper that's come out, um, I'll tell you what, we're, we're trying to keep we're trying to keep these episodes brief we're almost at 20 minutes already that sounds like a place where we can you know step right into episode two we've done uh, a, a good intro and then we can dig in because i'm sure i'm sure it'll it'll take some time to get through the abstract and the conclusions of that paper so let's let's do that in episode two randall well i'm certainly okay with that brad yeah we did i and i agreed to it i admit you know, and you, you said, you know, once I get going, um, it was, might be necessary for you to step in and put a stop to it. Yep. 15 minutes, 20 minutes flies by, but, uh, we're going to, we're going to try to keep these digestible for people and, uh, put a whole lot more of them out so we can get more information out and more, more of your hyperactive brain function, uh, and, and <laughs> super stream of consciousness uh, that people love to hear out in, in many forms. So Randall Reports is going to be another one of those. So thanks for joining us. Episode one, we're going to do it again and get into this paper by yep. Ignacio Ferrin and Vincenzo Orofino, Torrid Complex Smoking Gun, the Detection of Cometary Activity, coming up in episode two. All right. Thank you, Brad. You bet. You bet.